<laughs> so tell us, have you ever seen Uranus? <laughs> yes. That always puts me in a difficult position. Now that's funny. So folks, uh, tonight looks like it's going to be clear, uh, forecast is good. So I thought I'd give uh, imaging Uranus a go. And I have to say I'm not really quite sure what to expect. The last time that uh, Uranus was in such a favourable position and, and height in the sky was actually this time in 1960, so that was an awful long time ago. And uh, I, I have to be honest that I have never I've never imaged it before, I've never even seen it through a telescope before. So um, this is all a bit new territory for me and I'm not quite sure what to expect. So uh, hopefully the sky conditions are good tonight, um, I can see how uh, I get on and, and hopefully we'll get some nice views of it. At uh, this time of the year which is the 24th of February uh, 55 degrees north in the UK. Um, Uranus is just uh, past the meridian. It's still quite high though and it lies between the constellations of Taurus and uh, Pisces and just north of the constellation of Cetus. It reached opposition about three months ago at the end of October 2020 but still quite bright. It's a uh, magnitude around about 5.93. So technically it's still visible with a naked eye, but you still, um, still have to have some pretty dark skies and clear skies to see it. Okay, so here are some interesting facts about Uranus. Is that a fact? It was discovered in 1781 by Sir William Herschel. It's named after the Greek god of the sky. It's the seventh planet away from the sun only Neptune's further out. That's if you exclude Pluto as being a planet. Aha! Despite not being the furthest planet uh, out from the Sun, it's actually the coldest. And it has a, a minimum temperature of about minus 224 degrees Celsius. It has a radius of 15,700 miles, uh, which makes it the third largest planet after Jupiter and Saturn. One full day in Uranus is about 17 hours and one year, the time it takes to go around the sun, is equivalent to 84 Earth years. Uranus is unique in that it's the only planet which rotates on its side. Its north pole is actually pointed towards the sun, so it rotates on its side, rather like a wheel would on an axle, as opposed to the other planets which rotate uh, like a top. So it's unique in that respect. It's the only planet to do that. Its atmosphere is uh, comprised mainly of hydrogen and helium, but it does have substantial amounts of methane which gives it its sort of uh, greeny blue colour. It, it's, its estimated distance from the Earth is between 1.6 and 2 billion miles. That's quite a long way away. Uranus is a ringed planet. It has a, it's 13 rings have been detected around it, but none of these are visible from Earth. Uranus has 27 moons, the largest of which are Titania and Oberon, which have a diameter of 1600 kilometers and 1500 kilometers respectively. These moons, the largest moons, Titania and Oberon, were discovered by Herschel in 1787. This guy gets about it, doesn't he? The moons of Uranus are named after characters and plays written by Shakespeare and Pope. There's only been one spacecraft ever go anywhere near Uranus and that was Voyager 2 back in 1987. So let's have a look at uh, the view we can kind of expect using the equipment configuration uh, I've got tonight. Uh, I've plugged this into Stellarium and 
you zoom in and click on the ocular tab. Then this is, you can see that it's giving us a particular um, positions of the different moons. Although we're not going to have as nearly as much of a field of view or a magnification as this, so zooming out to something a bit more realistic. So it looks like Titania and Oberon, which are the largest moons, could potentially be imaged. I suspect we're going to get something that looks a bit like that in, in the field of view. But in order to, to actually pick up the, the two largest moons, I'm probably going to have to overexpose the disc to a huge extent, which will burn the detail out, but hopefully we might just pick these up. Uh, I think it will largely depend on, on, on the sky conditions, uh, whether we can do that or not. But, you know, let's see how it goes. Dare I say it? There's a... Transparency isn't brilliant, it's not bad, but certainly good enough to give it a go. Uh, there's a lot of moisture uh, in the atmosphere, it's quite, it's quite damp actually. You know, it's, it's worth a go. Let's try. Okay, so we're now imaging at f30. Got the two times paramate uh, on with the ASI385 uh, colour camera, non cooled, and um, we're getting some reasonable images coming in now. I think the focus is okay. Um, playing about with it, trying to get as many different um, bits of footage with little bits of focus either side, just trying to get it as good as I can. What I'm going to try now is I'm going to really uh, whack the exposure up and what will happen is I'm going to burn the planet disc out, uh, but what I'm hoping to achieve by doing this is perhaps being able to pick up its moons. I mean it won't be, <laughs> it won't be a pretty photograph uh, but uh, if we can uh, if we can image the moons, that'd be really cool. So I'm just moving the the uh, exposure up. Uh, can't really see anything at the moment. Um, but uh, time will tell, as they say. So, of course, because I've whacked up the um, exposure time, um, then the frame rate will drop on this particular camera. But we'll just let it run for us for a little while, get as many frames as we can. Well that session went pretty well. Um, the sky wasn't really that clear but it was it was good enough to get a view of it and that, that's actually what I wanted to, to do. Um, I wasn't expecting a, a detailed image of the planet. Of course it's far too far away and uh, you know, with the equipment I have, amateur equipment, it's just not going to get the magnification or the resolution uh, to produce any kind of fine detail on it. It really just shows us a, a greeny blue disc. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm quite pleased with the uh, performance of the telescope and the camera and uh, with the results I got uh, of, of, of Uranus itself. Uh, I imaged it at uh, f30, so I used the two times uh, power mate uh, with the ASI385 uh, color uh, one shot color camera. And uh, yeah, as I say, I was reasonably pleased with the result. It's I think it's as good as uh, you're going to get, really, uh, given the, the conditions I have and the equipment I have. Um, so I was quite pleased with that. It was also, by the way, um, I had a look at it through the eyepiece, which you know, as an astrophotographer, sometimes you, you, for, you, you don't do really. And it's a shame because it actually, dare I say it, in some ways it actually looks, it looks better through the, through the eyepiece. Um, you get a much more sense of, a greater sense of distance than, than you do with a photograph. I, I don't know how to explain it. I just thought it looked, I thought it looked a little more dramatic, uh, for want of a better word, uh, through the eyepiece. But anyway, the other thing, I, I, as you know, as I said earlier, I, I tried was to see if I could um, um, image the moons. So again, as I said, I whacked up the the um, sensitivity of the camera and the exposure time and the gain and everything, whacked it all up as high as I could. 
And I, you know, I think I might have caught Titania and Oberon. I think I might have. Or maybe it's just me and my mind seeing what I want to see. Well, here's my thinking and you decide whether it's just me or whether I'm onto something or not. So here's the integrated image I took from, from this wildly overexposed uh, shot. Um, and you can see uh, there's two structures there uh, that I think, according to Stellarium, are, are where you would expect Oberon and Titania to be. I think that's, this is them in this position here. The reason I think it's that is because obviously once I've turned up the gain and the explosion and everything, I'm getting an awful lot of noise and the, fl the frame rate's dropping and you're getting a lot of artefacts and noise that you could easily misinterpret as being something it isn't. But when I look at the individual frames and sure there's lots of little points of light that appear and disappear. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but what you actually see is throughout all the frames I've taken, these two particular objects are consistently in the same position. Now, if that was due to random noise, then I wouldn't expect that to be the case. But they are consistently visible in each frame, so that leads me to think that, yes, I might have got lucky and uh, actually caught them. And, and as I said uh, <laughs> at the beginning of this video, it certainly wasn't going to be, and it isn't, a, a, a nice photograph. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think uh, I managed to catch them. As I say, if you think I'm seeing things or I'm, I'm seeing what I want to see, please let me know. But that's my reason of just giving you why I think we might have just caught them. Uh, I'm prepared to be convinced I'm wrong. Uh, if you think I am, then uh, let me know. Uh, I, I'd be glad for your opinion on it. So that's this session over. Um, like I say, if, if I think if the sky transparency had been a little bit better, maybe we'd, we'd have got some uh, better results in the moons. I don't know. But uh, again, look, thanks for watching and um, if, you liked, if you're new to the channel and you like what you've seen, please give us a thumbs up and uh, please consider subscribing. It doesn't cost anything, it just means you get a heads up in any future content that I may um, produce. Um, but meantime, as I said, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you soon. And remember, keep watching the skies. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the sky.